Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about investing in property in outer lying suburbs. So that is uh, non-blue chip uh, suburbs or investment grade locations as I would typically uh, describe them. And I've noticed that some buyers agents uh, are promoting investing in affordable locations. And I guess on the face of it, I can kind of understand why some investors might be attracted to follow this advice, but it's really not until you delve into the theory and most importantly, the evidence that it becomes blatantly obvious that such investments have a very high probability of underperforming that is not working, not delivering the returns that you desire, in fact, not delivering much in the way of returns. Um, And when I say high probability, I mean, in the long run, it's almost certain to my mind. Now, I've noticed a a few posts on social media, LinkedIn, uh, and so forth, uh, of of some buyers agents sort of espousing uh, the benefits of investing in these sorts of outer area locations, uh, some even regional cities and so forth. And I noticed one particular um, advertisement like that or post uh, that uh, caught my eye and I thought I'd use as an example for this uh, podcast. And uh, the spies agent was advertising a a North Brisbane uh, location uh, where he purchased a a property for his client for $530,000. The estimated rental income was 480 per week, and the land size, I mean, it was on a large block of uh, 1,006 square metres, um, which he suggested had subdivision um, upside. So on the face of it, you think, well, that's not an expensive property relative to capital cities. That's a pretty healthy amount of rental income, and it's a large piece of land, so what could go wrong? Well... Uh, after a bit of research, I um, because obviously they don't really advertise the addresses to these properties, but after a bit of research, although they did have the photo, which is the giveaway, uh, after a bit of research, I found that actually the property was uh, located 17 k's north of Toowoomba. Uh, so that's not Brisbane. In fact, that's 140 kilometres away from Brisbane. So let's call it uh, a regional city, perhaps, because Toowoomba, Uh, has a population of only 120,000 people. So it is a relatively small city. There's plenty of vacant land surrounding it, and the property was located, in fact, in a relatively new estate, um, located literally, or surrounded, sorry, by literally an endless supply of vacant land. Uh, When when I looked at the um, historic uh, transactions for the particular property, I noticed that the land was purchased for $19,500 in March 2007, um, which happens to be the first premiership I saw the Geelong Cats win. So I just wanted to uh, drop that in because it's, it is actually important information to myself. Uh, well, to me anyway, I should say yes. Uh, anyway, and uh, a five-bedroom home was constructed on that land. Now, the, the land um, obviously has probably appreciated over that time since 2007, the value of that land. But of course, the, the value of the dwelling has and continues to depreciate as well. So uh, this is evidence, I think, by the past growth rate because the completed property was first sold in September 13 for $445,000. So remember, we bought for five thirty. Uh, so about $90,000 more. So therefore, over the past seven years, the value of the property has only appreciated by 2.5%. Uh, inflation over that time was 1.7%. So you've got real growth of 0.8% of a percent, um, barely worth the risk. In fact, not worth, worth the risk. Uh, now, the, the, the um, positive attribute is obviously the income from the property because you might go, well, Stuart, Uh, Let's say it's not going to grow, but at least we'll get the income. Great. So we're going to get $480 a week, uh, which equates to a gross rental yield of 4.7%, which by capital city standards is a very healthy yield. There's no doubt about that. But uh, the fact is that the property is mostly building value, not land value. Um, It's now a 14-year-old five-bedroom house. Um, It will start to need an increasing amount of ongoing maintenance or the property's value will diminish significantly. 
So I would argue that the maintenance, well, if you're going to put a tenant in there, you've got no question, uh, there, there's no discretion around whether you're going to complete that maintenance or not, the tenant's going to require it. So um, that that will uh, significantly eat into the rental yield. So 4.7 gross might end up being 2.7 or 2% net. Uh, arguably, you're better off to put your money in alternative investments like infrastructure or global property or uh, even... Uh, an income equity strategy investing in um, Aussie shares for dividends, uh, you're going to get be- much, 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 much better returns with much lower risk. So at first glance, uh, uh, something, um, a- an advertisement or a post like that starts to look like a good investment. You think, well, you know, it's um, it's relatively affordable and the rental income is high, um, but it's clear that it really doesn't have the attributes to drive capital growth. There's certainly no history of driving capital growth. And the supply and demand indicators indicate that the chance of getting capital growth uh, isn't positive. Uh, and then there's also um, some uh, headwinds in regards to whether it's going to continue to contribute or, or derive a, a reasonable level of net income after all the expenses. Now, I picked this uh, example randomly. In fact, when I picked it, I thought it was a Brisbane location just because of how the post was worded. Um, But I come across lots of examples of these sorts of properties. Now, they might not be in regional cities. They could be in outer lying suburbs. And one thing that I've noticed um, in business for nearly 20 years in Melbourne is that there's been a long line of buyers agents espousing the benefits of investing in Frankston, which is uh, an outer suburb of Melbourne. Uh, it's been lauded as the next growth suburb um, by many, many different people uh, for the past 20 years. I mean, I read an article probably every second year that tells me it's a great location to invest. Now, of course, there's going to be some properties in Frankston that have done well in terms of capital growth-wise. I mean, there's always exceptions that prove the rule. But I know over the past 20 years, investors have been much better rewarded uh, by investing in blue chip locations as opposed to um, uh, Frankston. So we're always going to see these advertisements and and so forth, um, uh, but we need to remind ourselves of investment fundamentals. Now, of course, there are some positive attributes. There's some attractions to investing in outer suburbs. Uh, The first one is the price point. Um, now, you, you know, you can buy a house uh, on a thousand square metres for just over a little over half a million dollars. You know, that seems like good value. How can you go wrong? Um, and so that price point is uh, beneficial because either A, you can invest in uh, multiple properties. Uh, so instead of buying one, you could buy two or three. Uh, and secondly, for those people that have very, you know, have, have quite tight borrowing capacities, it might be the case of either investing or not investing in property at all. So that could be the price points are an attraction. And then secondly, because properties in outer locations tend to have a lower land value component, and certainly the land value per square meter is uh, less valuable than uh, land close to the city, um, typically what you find is most of the property is building value rather than land value. And of course that then drives a higher rental yield um, and so that can help affordability too. So if we've got a, re- a gross rental yield of 4.7%, uh, setting aside any major maintenance or improvement uh, requirements, you know, that property is probably going to wash its own face. Its, its income, gross income, will probably pay for all the expenses. And that's an attraction to some people. But of course, so they're the, the positive attributes, the... Uh, the, the shine, I guess, it's the lipstick on the pig, if you like. Uh, but there's obviously some substantial um, fundamental weaknesses with investing in these locations. So the first thing to recognise is the supply, supply and demand fundamentals are significantly different. Now, we have to make friends with that and we've got to realise that's going to have an impact on future returns. So firstly, the supply of vacant land in surrounding localities is typically infinite. It's abundant. There's, you need more land, you just build further out, the city starts to spread. Um, you can't do that in an established suburb. Uh, and the demand for property reduces the further you move away from a capital city CBD. And I'm going to talk about why that is in a second. The second consideration is the tenant profile. 
you know, tenants in these locations are more likely to be sort of lower to middle income earners. They're probably likely to be a young family with kids and pets that create a lot of wear and tear on your property. Um, compare that to, say, a professional couple renting in a blue chip suburb. Um, they've probably got almost zero chance of uh, involuntary unemployment. Uh, and they probably don't spend too much time in the actual property. You know, they probably spend time out with their friends at work, all those sorts of things. So wear and tear is, uh, is lower. And lastly, I think it's super important to recognise that the impact of borrowing capacities over the past uh, three to four decades have had a substantial impact to price growth in outer suburbs. So that is... Uh, the average Australian's borrowing capacity has increased by somewhere between two and three times since the early 1980s. So, you know, we, we can borrow a lot more on the same level of income today than what we could 30 years ago. Now, that increases my capacity uh, and that will drive, that has driven price growth. But but I believe that borrowing capacities have peaked. That 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 trend won't continue the borrowing capacities won't be two to three times more in, in another 30 years from here. They will only move in line with income, and we know in, people's incomes really aren't changing, so people's borrowing capacities really won't be able to change. So we won't see the same rising tide of the flow of greater borrowings uh, enter into that market. I still think people will be highly geared, but in terms of borrowing capacities, it's going to be more linked to their income. Um, uh, than really any changes in banking and so forth. And that means that the historic capital growth rates in those locations won't repeat themselves over the next 30 years. Now, of course, it would be remiss of me to remind you that, of course, there are some um, uh, real strong attributes of investing in blue chip locations that are unique to these locations that are, um, suggest that it, it, they exhibit lower investment risk and are going to provide higher investment returns. So we know that price appreciation occurs when demand persistently exceeds supply. And I want to underline that word persistently because persistently means it's, it's, uh, it never eases up and it's over very long periods of times. So putting aside the affordability, loca- uh, affordability considerations, most people desire to live near the CBD, not in it, but surrounding it. And of course, there's a cohort of people that love living in the country, etc., etc. I'm just talking as a, as a general rule of thumb. These locations tend to um, provide greater employment opportunities, you know, a vast array of different opportunities and career progression and so forth. And of course, they provide better amenities, you know, entertainment, schooling, medical, pastime acti- activities, those sorts of things. Um, but supply of housing is finite and fixed, right? There's only so many houses in Turak. There's not a lot of subdivision going on in Turak because the land value is just too expensive and doesn't really lend itself to it. Um, So we're not going to change the number of houses in Turak. In fact, they'll probably reduce. um, It's a falling supply rather than uh, a steady or, or increasing supply. And there's little to no vacant land as well in these locations. You might find a vacant block. Very difficult, though. Normally, there's going to be a dwelling on it, and you're going to have to pay something for that dwelling. You're not just going to get land value. So as such, in these sorts of locations, it's really not difficult to visualise that demand is going to persistently exceed supply. Now, you've got to think about, you know, one of the pushbacks sometimes we get from people is, okay, Stuart, but, you know, these these locations, you've already, you know, got to spend one and a half to two million dollars to get a house in these locations. How high can it go? Well, let's remind us about the remind ourselves about the distribution of wealth. The richest twenty percent of Australians own sixty four percent, or two thirds of all household wealth. Top twenty percent, and between two thousand and three and two thousand and seventeen, this top twenty percent grew their wealth by sixty eight percent, compared to just six percent for the bottom twenty percent, the le- least wealthy twenty percent. So it's this cohort of Australians that can afford and will drive uh, the property prices in blue chip locations perpetually higher. We're not thinking about macroeconomic indicators here. We're not thinking about the general population. What we're really thinking about is the top 20% that have a desire to live in this location, 
that continually grow their wealth, their incomes are rising by far, at a faster rate than uh, the general population. And it's these people that are going to push prices higher. Remember, what we want to do is invest in locations that have the highest probability of having that sustainable and perpetual demand, excessive demand. You know, you might, you've got to remind yourselves you might own the property for 30 years. So you've got to pick a location that's going to remain popular over that time. It's not the next growth suburb. It's not the rising tide that you're looking for in an outer area. It's something that is a steady, consistent performer where there's strong evidence of that past performance. Now, as a reminder, you, it's, it's just basic logic that you cannot expect above average returns from a below or average quality asset. Whether it's a property or a share or a managed fund or whatever, quality at the end of the day is going to drive all the long-term returns. Um, and so the best thing you can do is invest in the highest quality assets possible because that reduces your risk. You know, if you've got a, a pink diamond as opposed to a white diamond, you know, and, and diamonds become unpopular, the pink diamond's probably still going to be popular and going to give you good returns. So you're protecting yourself for the unknown or changes in the market by leveling up in, in quality. You're reducing your risk. And the probability is the pink diamond's always going to do better. And the pink diamond's going to um, appreciate at a faster rate than a typical white diamond. And that's how you need to think of property investing is you want to invest in that pink diamond. Now, just to wrap up, it's probably tempting for some buyer's agents to buy at any price point. Um, if I uh, generate a whole bunch of leads from prospective clients, I'm going to have a bunch of those, uh, those leads that probably can't afford to spend a million dollars in a blue chip location. Um, but we know that the only way we're going to be able to buy something for half a house for half a million dollars if we make some compromises with respect to investment principles and investment fundamentals. And what I'm telling you today is there is never a reason to compromise on fundamentals when investing. That is probably the biggest mistake that you can make and it's an extremely costly one. So if you're going to invest in property, do it well, do it properly. And if that means putting all your eggs in one basket, that is you can only afford to invest in one property, that's fine. If you can't afford to invest in property, then invest in other assets. Let's not have blinkers on thinking that property is the only asset to invest in. Of course, there's other assets available to us. Okay, that's it from me for this week. I uh, hope that's enjoyable. Please, just as a reminder, if you like the podcast, please rate it and share it wherever you're listening to your podcasts. It certainly does help uh, get it out there and improve the ratings and get more people listening. Uh, and until next week, bye for now.